Well, these certainly are some interesting times we're living in. Hopefully, if you're watching or listening to this episode in the future, coronavirus is nothing but a distant memory. For now, though, Trexone is podcasting five days a week to help get you through your home isolation or your commute to work, whatever your life is throwing up at you at the moment. It's another week here on Trexone, and today, Dr. Kayla Yakovino is joining me to chat about Star Trek and her work as an experimental petrologist. Across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube, this is the eighth season of A Trek Zone Conversation with Matt Miller. Well, as coronavirus continues to lock down humanity across the planet, Dr. Kayla Yakovino is on the line from her home isolation. Kayla, thanks for having a Trek Zone conversation today. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, you're an editor and podcaster for Trek Movie by Night, but by day, an experimental petrologist. Can you tell us what that means? What What is an experimental petrologist? I'm uh, basically, a, I'm a geologist. Uh, I study specifically volcanoes um, on Earth and across the solar system. Um, and I study them experimentally. So I, I go out into the field and I, I go collect rocks and volcanoes and take measurements. But then a lot of my work also takes place in a laboratory where I'm taking those rocks and, and performing experiments on them. Um, and what we mainly do in my lab is we recreate the conditions of rock formation. So that's like the conditions inside of planets. Um, when we're looking at volcanic rocks, that's the conditions inside, say, a magma chamber. So like really high temperatures, really high pressures, um, and we can take rocks or we can make our own fake rocks, actually. And we put them at really high pressures and temperatures, and then we cook them for a bit, and we kind of look at them and we see what kinds of crystals grow. Um, we see how the volcanic gases are created from the rocks, things like that. Um, and that helps us to understand how rocks form on the earth, why volcanoes erupt, when a volcano might erupt. It also helps us to understand planets throughout our solar system and beyond. So what are they made of? How did they get there? Those kinds of questions. Um, and so I work for uh, a company called Jacobs, who is the contract company at NASA Johnson Space Center. So I work on site at Johnson Space Center. Um, although this week I am teleworking from my home office. Um, so all of the NASA centers moved to what they're calling stage three, at least, which is a mandatory telework situation. Um, some, you know, quote unquote mission critical folks at Johnson are still there. So we have astronauts in space right now and they need to be able to talk to earth. So our mission control people are there uh, working. People who need to take care of various sensitive instruments are going in periodically to check on them, things like that. So the gears are still turning at NASA, but as many of us as possible are staying home, um, you know, doing our best to, to keep ourselves isolated and do this social distancing and, um, yeah, just trying to do as much work as we can from home without this, you know, looming threat of this coronavirus hanging over our heads. So it's been a bit of a challenging week, I'm sure, for everyone. Yeah, and it's really fascinating as well just how different businesses and industries uh, are responding to to the coronavirus. Um, one thing was said to me last week that you sort of don't have an appreciation for how other industries are impacted unless you're actually in that industry. So, you know, the I mean, the aviation sector is is probably a little bit more public in that regard. But in terms of NASA and uh, and astronomical work and, and ge geological work and, and stuff like that, for my work in, in television news, there's all these sort of industries that, that have to keep those, those wheels turning. Otherwise, there's just so much... Not just lost productivity, but um, but lost lost research as well. Stuff that was in progress when all of this mm -hmm. happened. Yeah, and there's a there are a lot of things, um, even in just just in the building that I work in. So the the main research building um, on campus that you know you, I don't even necessarily think about day to day. So we have um, one of the things that we do at Johnson. Not only do we do the manned spaceflight operations uh, for NASA, but we also are the curators of space materials. So everything from the Apollo samples that came back from the Apollo from the moon during the Apollo mission, missions oh, wow. to um, meteorites. We have um, 
uh, the collection of meteorites that are collected every year in Antarctica um, and some other samples here and there. But yeah, so most of the Apollo samples are at Johnson. And we also have things like um, that, like ice Sam icy samples or things that need to be kept frozen. So those have to be kept in a deep freeze and those kinds of freezers need to be checked on periodically. You know, if one of those has some kind of malfunction while no one's on site, then we lose all of those samples. Um, if something happens and the, the moon samples are kept, you know, in very specific environments. Um, and if anything were to happen to the labs that curate those specific rocks, you know, you, you can imagine how precious the Apollo samples are. We haven't sent a, a human to the moon since the Apollo era. So, you know, going on 40 years now, 40, 50 years now. And so the, we have a limited number of those samples of the moon. Uh, so something happens to those. Obviously, it's a big hit to science in general. So there are a lot of people working really hard right now to just like you said, make sure the wheels keep turning. And those Apollo samples are, were, were pretty expensive cost per gram to get them back, really, weren't they? So Yeah, it's true. In fact, one fact that I love to tell people is that the Apollo missions was the largest financial undertaking ever in mankind, all of, all of the history of mankind. So they're more expensive than, oh, you know, wow. the Apollo program was more expensive than the Manhattan Project, for example. It wow. was, yeah, there was a lot of resources poured into that. So in terms of your work looking at uh, at other planets in our solar system, uh, I guess it, it's sort of going to how the solar system's formed uh, and what we can learn about that and, and I guess the best places to start our exploration of the solar system. Would I sort of be on the right track there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I, you know, I study this from a lot of different angles and one of those angles is looking at Earth to understand our solar system and vice versa, looking at things in the solar system to understand the earth so we have you know a lot of information compared to any other planet obviously the the planet we know most about is earth because we're here we can access it easily um and there's been a lot of people who have been thinking about earth for quite a long time so we have a lot of information about what the earth is like but mm -hmm. how do we know what that means you know if we if i tell you the composition of a rock on the earth it's like okay who cares but if i say oh well actually this has way more platinum than, you know, a rock from this other planet or what, you know, whatever thing you're interested in, for example. Um, now it's in context, right? So you're like, oh, why is this rock rich in platinum and this rock isn't? Does it have to do with, you know, the planet that it formed on, its location in the solar system or, or things like that? Um, and one of the things my group is really interested in is in understanding certain elements that we call volatile elements. And those are the things that typically make up gases. Um, things like water, H2O, uh, carbon, carbon dioxide and other forms of carbon, uh, methane, for example, um, sulfur, fluorine, chlorine. Uh, and one thing that these all have in common is that they're all very important for Earth-based life. So as far as we know, any life that we've ever discovered needs all of these elements to, to be created and then to survive. Um, you know, things like oxygen, water, carbon, but we don't really know where those elements came from or why they exist in such great abundance on the earth. The earth has a ton of water. So this is one thing that we've learned over the past 50 years. When we learn, when we look out to places like Mars and the moon um, and other places that we have meteorites from, these other worlds are by comparison, bone dry to, compared to earth. You know, we are covered, we're an ocean planet really. Most of the earth's surface is water uh, and this has been a driver in trying to understand how life forms on other planets. You know, we've been trying to follow the water, find where the water could be, because that leads to life here. You know, that's the idea that we have. Um, and so we look at these other, um, other rocks from outer space, meteorites, lunar rocks, and we try to make very, very detailed measurements of the rocks to see if we can suss out uh, the history of things like water in those rocks. And what I mean by that is well, I might pick up a moon rock today and it might be very dry. It might not have very much water locked up in its crystal structure, but in fact, maybe it did in the past, or maybe the, maybe I'm holding a piece of lava from the moon and the, and the body of lava that, that this piece came from, maybe it had some water in it. And even if I can't measure that directly, I don't see that H2O molecule. I can use really, really high precision measurements to look for signs and clues that water may have existed. Uh, there at some time. So we can use these rocks as sort of a window 
into the very, very early history of planets and say, okay, was there a lot of water in this location? Maybe, maybe you know, maybe Mars had water um, more abundant on its surface earlier in its history. And those clues are locked up in the rocks. And so we spend a lot of time looking very, very closely at the chemical compositions of the rocks, the types of crystals that they have inside of them. And then by, by doing this process in the lab, where we are growing our own rocks, um, we can create rocks under known conditions. So it's like a, a control. You know, we have our control group where we say, okay, we know exactly the pressure, the temperature, the chemistry needed to create a rock that looks like this. And then I pick up my natural rock that came from Mars and I say, okay, it has all these characteristics. Uh, well, which, which experiment does it match most closely to? Um, and then I can say, okay, it, so it must have required this pressure, this temperature, this composition in order to look the way it does. And so the, the work we do in the lab is basically like, like calibrating our instruments. Because kind of like I said before, it's just like the platinum analogy that I used. You know, we can take a measurement of a rock and I can tell you the a, a very precise silica content of the rock or magnesium content of the rock. But who cares if we don't know what that means? And so what the experiments do is we create this sort of database that can tell us how to interpret the, the, the geochemical measurements we make. So now I say, okay, if I have this much magnesium in the rock, it means this, that, and the other thing. Um, and so that's like the very sort of roundabout way of describing this whole process of how we use the natural rocks in concert with what we do in the lab to, yeah, understand the early origins of the solar system and all the way over to life on Earth even. How does one go about creating a rock in a lab? So we have a couple ways we can do it. We can actually create a rock from scratch. And by that, I mean we, so rocks are made up of various chemical elements and we can take those chemical elements typically as powders. So I can take some magnesium, um, some silicon, some aluminum, uh, some iron, phosphorus, all of those things. And I basically just take powdered forms of those that we can, we can buy from chemical companies and mix those up into a mixture. And now I have a powder and that composition of that powder is the same as a real rock. Oh, wow. But then I can take that powder and I put it into one of our pieces of equipment and I take it up to really high pressure and really high temperature. And then it forms into an actual rock. So it will melt, it will turn into maybe a glass, it will start to grow crystals. So then you end up with something that looks like maybe a lava. So you have volcanic glass that's surrounding um, crystals like olivine, uh, plagioclase, pyroxene. These are all typical crystals we might see in a, in a piece of lava. Oh, wow. So we can make our own lava just by mixing up the chemi chemicals in the right components and then in the right uh, proportions and then squeezing them and heating them, basically. Wow. So basically what nature does over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, you can do in a lab in... In, in a few months or even less. <laughs> yeah, no, an experiment can take a few hours. It can take oh, a couple wow. days. Yeah, so we, yeah, we can speed up that process quite a bit. That is amazing. Well, NASA's sending another rover to Mars, the Perseverance rover, um, mm -hmm. and in that mission is going to be uh, a sample return uh, or a return sample um, coming back from them at a later stage. Is that something that you're going to be looking into? Those rocks, are you going to be um, investigating them? Oh, I would absolutely love to. So, yeah, what the, the, the plan is to send this rover, collect some rocks there, and then wait until we can send another mission to then pick up the rocks and bring them back to Earth. So this is definitely a long-term plan. Um, and they haven't chosen, you know, which scientists will get a chance to look at those rocks yet. But, yeah, of course, I would love to jump at the opportunity to even just be able to look at those rocks, you know, inside <laughs> of a, um, even if it were inside of a glass box or something like that, that would just be yeah. an amazing thing to see. The next step of course would be if they sent you to Mars to collect those uh, samples. Oh yeah. Sign me up. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a ge geologist dream really, wouldn't it? To, to head over to Mars and, and, uh, and instead of being, uh, uh, having to think what these rocks would be like, uh, actually see them. Uh, in person and be able to handle them and, and in, investigate them. Definitely. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, what a, we do so much research with the rovers, but what a rover can do in a few years, a, a human could probably do in a day or two. Wow. Um, humans are just really efficient and they don't have to wait for marching orders from 
you know, from mission control, they can, they have autonomy. They can go and pick up a rock that's interesting. Um, you know, they can carry a lot more. They can, they can travel a lot faster and farther. So it's just, you know, we, we've learned so, so much from the rovers and they're so important, but it's like nothing compared to actually getting boots on the ground. Well, Kayla, what came first for you, Star Trek or uh, geology? Definitely Star Trek. I pretty <laughs> much grew up watching it. I don't remember a time in my life where I wasn't a fan of the show. Uh, I was a kid when I was a, I was a baby when Next Generation started airing. Um, and my parents were fans. And so they would watch it as the new episodes would come out, you know, with their friends. And so I just sort of grew up with it there. And um, as I got old enough to understand it, watched it with my mom and my dad and just, yeah, it was just like a part of my life. I didn't even stop to question it or like label myself a Trekkie at the time. I was just like, yeah, this is just a thing that we do. We watch Star Trek (laughs) (laughs) because of course we do. And did that, did that inspire a career in in the science? It definitely inspired me to go to the science. Honestly, I, I, I wouldn't say it led me directly to geology, but it led me there in a roundabout way because when I was young, um, and a lot of people probably, you know, can relate to this. Um, like when I was in high school, geology was treated as sort of a second class science. It was taught at my school, but you were able to skip it if you thought you were you know, clever enough to, which of course I did. So I skipped it. Um, and in a lot of schools, it's not taught at all. They teach biology, chemistry, and physics, but a lot of schools don't even teach our science. And so I never would have considered a career in geology. I didn't even know that was an option. Never crossed my mind. But in reality, what I learned from when I you know, went to college and um, started getting into science classes and quickly learned that being a geologist is the closest thing in my mind that you can get to being an explorer on Star Trek. I think it's, for me, it gets me closer to that than being an astronomer even. Because with astronomy, you know, you're, you're looking at these things from afar, you're looking at things through telescopes, where with geology, especially Earth-based geology, you're physically going to places, you know, you're, you're putting your hands on the outcrop of rock, you're, you're ex- exploring new strange places on our own planet that are just as alien as anything you could imagine, and interacting with all kinds of cultures, people who live in these crazy different geologic environments all over the world and learning how they interact with with different things. I study volcanoes and so going from country to country and and learning how volcanoes are an integral part of people's lives when they live right on top of them. So places like Italy and Africa and Costa Rica, they all interact with the volcanoes in different ways. And so it's that I I, I love my job. I get to fulfill that need for, you know, human exploration and reaching out and and talking to other people and sort of learning more about myself that way and my place in the universe and also exploring scientifically the actual physical land that I'm on and then getting to go back to my lab and (laughs) and nerd out over things and think about things and you know debate with my colleagues about this or that um so for me that and you know Star Trek what Star Trek means to someone is different for everyone and but what I took away from it is exactly that and so I just love that I get to do that every day. It is very cool. And of course, people can find you on social media at Kayla I and also writing and editing and podcasting for Trek Movie as well, the awesome Trek news site that they are. And you can, of course, find me at Miramat86 and Trek Zone all across social media. Kayla, thanks so much for having a Trek Zone conversation today. It's been fascinating to learn uh, about petrology uh, and, and the work continuing as humanity pauses for a moment. <laughs> (laughs) Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. It was really fun chatting with you. 